Hi there, I'm Dr. Stephen Fallon. Welcome to this new video. This is Dental Excellence Video 21. And today I was inspired to create this Dental Excellence video because yesterday I saw a uh, regular patient during recall, during his hygiene recall appointment, came in to check him and it was a patient many of you are likely familiar with because he is case study one from my Vertical Dimension online seminar or Vertical Dimension webinar. And if you recall, we opened his Vertical Dimension with uh, occlusal veneers, or maybe you could call them onlays or onlay veneers. I'm not sure what you'd want to call them. They're basically bonded restorations, bonded porcelain restorations to open the Vertical Dimension where we're bonding on top of the tooth without a lot of tooth preparation. So it leads to my concept of what we'd like is a strong tooth, not so much a strong restoration. But, you know, this patient I treated 13 years ago, and they are strong restorations as well. Um, the restorations, these, this case, the whole lower arch was completed with bonded feldspathic porcelain restorations, which are not the strongest type of porcelain, but they've turned out to be really strong restorations because A, the tooth is still very strong, and B, the occlusal, occlusion design is, is really good for this case, obviously, because it's done so well over the past 13 years. So today, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about um, occlusal veneers, onlay veneers, onlays, whatever you want to call them to open the vertical dimension. And I'm going to show you some uh, images from this case, as well as the 13-year post-op photos that I shot yesterday. And I'm also going to show you a new case that I've treated this year with occlusal veneers again uh, to open the vertical dimension. Um, there are a couple crowns on this case because of the various restorative needs of a couple of the molars, but there's also occlusal veneers again to open the vertical dimension for that patient so we could gain room for a restorative material. So uh, let me show you the case. So if you recall, if you've seen this case, this is uh, the lower arch of this case. We completed the lower arch with all bonded porcelain restorations. And that's where we opened the vertical dimension was on the lower arch because the upper arch, the posterior molars didn't really need to be treated. So I decided to open the vertical dimension almost entirely with the lower arch. And the lower arch, the molars didn't need to be treated either. And this case could have been treated likely with orthodontics and less restorative dentistry, but the patient declined orthodontics. So we went with restorative dentistry, but just because we're doing restorative dentistry and the patient declined orthodontics doesn't mean we have to do a really destructive tooth preparation design. So I elected to do more of an additive onlay or occlusal veneer design. And I'll share with you the preparations. This is the diagnostic wax up and the final restorations for the case. Uh, these are some uh, side views of the final restorations of the case. And here's the actual preparations. And you can see um, really they're very conservative preparations. Uh, here where you see the preparation in the middle of the prep, it's really an old amalgam that I took out and left the outline form of the amalgam, it actually heat helps seeding the veneer a lot better than, for example, this one where we've just really created a concavity on the surface of the tooth, a light preparation of a concavity, and uh, we're building the onlay on top of that. This is harder to seat because there isn't really a stopping point other than the fissures. So now, uh, the last 13 years when I do this technique, I actually generally prep a little cross type of retentive a seeding uh, portion of the prep, just a small one in the fissures, smaller than this, that helps me seat the restoration and prevent it from sliding around, which I found was a little bit of a challenge with this type of design without any kind of seeding uh, retention, retention mechanism. These over here are onlay veneers, kind of an onlay with a veneer on the front. Um, this one's just a traditional veneer prep, and it goes that way throughout the arch. And the idea is, again, open the vertical dimension without over-preparing the teeth. And you can see this is now the 13-year post-op photo of the lower arch. 
Uh, these are onlay veneers. This is an onlay. Uh, this is an onlay. These are veneers. These are onlay veneers. This is an onlay and this is an onlay. Prepared very conservatively. If you look at the uh, side views or more close-up views of the 13-year post-ops, this is after the hygiene appointment. So it's got a little bit of tissue trauma from scaling. <laughs> uh, he does get a little bit of calculus buildup around his natural dentition. So there's a little trauma from scaling. But um, he doesn't tend to get, you know, this is the interesting thing with porcelain restorations. They don't tend to get a lot of calculus buildup or tartar buildup around them because they're so smooth. So he doesn't really have that. He has it more around his tooth structure. Um, he's in a, on a regular basis to have this scaled. But look at the the actual restorations, you know, the restorative tissue interface or restorative enamel interface looks really good. Uh, restorations look beautifully intact. And these are feldspathic uh, layered ceramics. They're not monolithic Emacs or lithium disilicate. Well, that's the same thing. Or um, uh, the older Empress type of material. These are just feldspathic layered ceramics. And so here's the one month post-op of the case, and here's the 13 year post-op of the case. It hardly looks any different, <laughs> you know, it's quite amazing. Really nice to see. Um, and here's the one month post-op of the case and the 13 year post-op of the case. There is some tissue inflammation and that's mostly just from the scaling, I think. And, you know, probably he doesn't floss every day. That would be my guess, looking at a little bit of tissue inflammation there. Uh, but the restorative restorations look amazing, and um, there's been no fracturing of these restorations, and they have held up exceptionally well for a weaker restorative material. Uh, today, on the newer case that I'm going to share with you, I actually used Emax or lithium disilicate for the molars. I used feldspathic still for the bicuspids and the cuspid veneers on the new case, but I elected to switch to lithium disilicate for the molars. So here are the preparations, the actual dye models of the case. And you can see again, just the preparation design. As I said, this design here, where we have kind of just a tabletop occlusal veneer with some concavity to the preparation, this and this, this is a little harder to seat because there's no retentive points. This was much easier to seat because of this occlusal um, amalgam that was removed kind of created a little jig for seating. Um, and then also having the little slight partial veneer on the facial of uh, the two first molars gave me a little bit easier time seating them as well. And then the onlay veneers are even easier on the um, bicuspids because they have a veneer on the facial again. Um, and then here are the preparation photos from 13 years ago. It's almost 14 years ago when I initially prepared the case. Um, and you can see the preparation design, very conservative, lots of remaining tooth structure to uh, bond to. And the key here, I think, for long-term bond strength of these bonded porcelain restorations is I left a tremendous amount of enamel to bond to on these restorations. If you look at the veneers, the veneer preps are largely completely in enamel. So a lot of enamel to bond to, that leads to long-term success. Excellent occlusal design or occlusion design, I would say, leads to really good long-term success. Selecting an appropriate vertical dimension for these cases where I open the vertical dimension with a onlay type of restoration, I think helps lead to long-term success as well. And here are the restorations once again. These are feldspathic restorations. Here's an occlusal view of the stone model, solid model in that case. Here's a close-up of the restorations. Here are all the restorations. And here's a before and after of the lower arch. You can see the, the uh, preparation design really just kind of smoothed out the wear facetting on the lower arch of the anterior teeth. He had a tremendous amount of wear on the anterior portion, not as much wear on the posteriors because he had a, a deep uh, class 2 div 2 type of overbite that we opened and improved with the opening of the vertical dimension. 
and just fixed the amount of tooth wear that he had in the anterior. And so here's the opening of the vertical. Looks quite good. Looks quite good. And if you're interested in how it is I determined where to build the vertical dimension for this case, and you haven't seen my altering the vertical dimension case studies online seminar or webinar, um, I would recommend you take a look at that training. It's a free training that I offer, and a lot of people have gone through it. A number of people maybe have started it and not finished it. We're actually showing three different case studies in, in total, as well as a couple of smaller case studies. So there's about two smaller cases, three full case studies, this being case study number one that I showed you the 13-year post-ops for right now. And if you're interested, you know, we're showing three different concepts for opening the vertical dimension for wear patients. And I also answer why you would even alter the vertical dimension for patients like this. And the big question though is, do each of these patients have a specific vertical dimension that you need to follow? And what is the vertical dimension that you would follow for these patients? And which vertical dimension would you select if you are looking at three different options? So the webinar or online seminar will answer all of these questions as well as the seven critical factors you must consider when you alter or restore the vertical dimension. And as I said, there's basically three options that I'm teaching here. This particular patient from yesterday, Joey, he's this option, option one. And if you look, these are his before images. So you can see he would have been a good ortho case too. Maybe even ortho with some orthognathic surgery. He totally declined ortho, but I felt I couldn't restore him it, at his current vertical dimension and occlusion design. If you look at that far photo over here, he had an extremely deep overbite. And he needed a tooth extracted. He needed this upper restorative work re, redone. And he had a lot of wear on his lower anteriors. So we wanted to open the vertical dimension to give all of this a better chance of long-term survival because he didn't agree to orthodontics. And I believe seeing post-op uh, appointments with him for 13 years that we selected the correct option for altering the vertical dimension and the occlusion and restorative design for his case. As you can see, you can't argue with 13-year long-term success results. So I wanted to just share that with you to give you some things to think about. Um, not always when you open the vertical dimension do you have to go with, you know, metal ceramic or gold restorations. You can go with even weaker restorations like these feldspathic occlusal veneers and they can hold up really well. Now today I would frequently use Emacs, so I'll show you that case as well, this recent case, Emacs at least on the molars. I still like feldspathic on the bicuspids and incisors and cuspids, but on the molars I think that Emacs is a stronger restoration and I'm using that. Um, if you're interested in uh, joining my Altering the Vertical Dimension case studies online seminar, as I said, it's free for the next um, next little while. I'm going to offer it once again for the next little while. Um, Here's one of the registration pages. Here's another one. We're kind of testing the two different designs. If you wanted to, you could leave a comment and let me know which one you like better, the one with the pictures or the one that's just plain text. So we're split testing, as they say, the two designs and seeing, trying to get a handle on which one is actually preferred by people. Um, but the bottom line is you can register at www.failindentalseminars.com slash seven critical factors. We'll actually put a link below this video which will allow you to register for the seminar. And as I said, I'm gonna offer it as a free training for all of you in the next, for the next few weeks. And if you haven't seen this seminar in a while, I'd say that it's a good idea to join and refresh your memory of the cases because um, I just saw recently case number three as well. I'll maybe do another video on that because I took some 
long-term post-ops. Now case three, I think was eight year post-ops, but it still looks really great. And it's a much more severe wear patient than case one that um, I saw yesterday. So I'll share those in a future video, the post-ops for that case. Um, but again, I just saw him very recently. Uh, case two, I haven't seen him in about a year in the practice. I've seen him outside the practice once. He's doing well as well. All the cases, knock on wood, <laughs> that I'm sharing in that webinar are doing really, really well long term. Um, as I said, I wanted to share with you one of the other current cases that I treated. Uh, this case I featured in the April 2018 Occlusion Design Members webinar. And if you look, this was a severe wear patient, younger patient with um, uh, acid erosion on her lower uh, posterior teeth, basically from cusp and back. The lower incisors didn't seem to have a lot of erosion, but the cusp and back had a significant erosion, and the upper anteriors from bicuspid forward had significant erosion. Very significant erosion on the first bicuspids, on the upper, and the cuspids and the incisors. So this case was also a case where I did a lot of bonded porcelain restorations in feldspathic, actually. The whole case was feldspathic porcelain, except for the lower molars, which were lithium disilicate. So if you look at the case, here's the lower arch in provisionals. Again, I didn't treat the lower incisors. We did also speak to her about ortho. I tell all these restorative cases, most of them could benefit from ortho. So I check and see if they'd be interested in an ortho referral. And some of them I insist on it because it's clearly the best thing to do. Um, as long as they go for a consult and discuss it and then let me know what they actually think. But she didn't want uh, orthodontics. And uh, I said, I can't really do a lot with your lower incisors then. And she said, that's not a concern. They're not sore. The other teeth were actually sore from the amount of erosion she had. She couldn't eat ice cream or cold drinks or anything with ice in it. And so she wanted this done, A, because she knew that her teeth were breaking and damaged and eroded. And B, because she wanted to be able to have a normal diet without pain. So uh, this is the lower uh, arch in provisionals. So this was in provisionals here. You can see the preparations on the left-hand side of your screen and the provisionals on the right. The preparations were a veneer, onlay veneer, onlay veneer, jacket crown here because of, um, I think the tooth had an endo and a large restoration. So that we did as a jacket crown. Onlay here with the little kind of notched uh, seating jig in the center that I spoke about. Otherwise, really very little preparation. And then veneer, onlay veneer, onlay veneer. And these were both jacket crowns because one had uh, endodontic restorations or endodontic treatment. And one had a really quite a big deep um, previous restoration plus decay and a distal fracture. So we decided to do that tooth, treat that tooth with a full coverage crown. And here are the final restorations for the lower arch. Uh, if you've been following dental excellence and my training overall, you know that I complete the cases one arch at a time. In this case, I completed the lower restorations first. So the lower arch was completed first, and then we um, tested the lower arch against the upper provisionals, which didn't take long because she was pretty adaptive. And um, the uh, finished the uh, lower, or sorry, the upper restorations a month later. So that was kind of what we did there. Again, you can kind of see this little seating jig that I made in the center of the occlusal uh, veneer. It really does help seating these restorations. I think you'll find that beneficial if you use that. Uh, here are the restorations. These are Emacs. These are Feldspathic porcelain. So Emacs and Feldspathic porcelain. Here's the restorations just to look at them on a uh, little carbon fiber type of plate. Here's the inside of the restorations. This here shows you the uh, occlusal veneer and the occlusal veneer was roughly about 1.4 millimeters thick. So I tend to make these occlusal restorations when we're opening the vertical about 1.3 to 1.5 millimeters thick. 
and that helps give a little bit more strength to the restoration without over preparing the teeth because generally you're opening the vertical dimension by something in that range so you don't have to prepare the tooth very much. This case type I believe was case type 2 in my opening the vertical dimension system. And here's some uh, restoration uh, images. Here's the actual onlay. During the April webinar, I showed video that I shot in the Zeiss microscope, um, bonding in the occlusal veneer or onlay with a full rubber dam isolation. And then I used the isolate for the jacket crown. It just makes uh, things go easier for the occlusal veneer. And then here's the actual case. So the before and afters. Again, all the anterior restorations, everything that's restored here is Feldspathic porcelain, so layered ceramics. The molars are Emax. The upper molars and the upper second bicuspids, I actually bonded composite to fill in the erosion and reshape the teeth to create a better occlusion design. I didn't restore them with any kind of porcelain. Didn't really feel I needed to. But you can see the before and after smile views, close-up image of the smile view. She's very thrilled with the way this looks. I like this smile design, the overall outline form of the restorations. I think it looks nice. Has a great, I believe, occlusion design. Time will tell over the next 15 years, obviously. Um, and then if you look at the lateral views, you know, this, I think, looks really good. And natural looking too, if you look at the close up here. As I said, the second bicuspid and the molars weren't restored. I just did some bonding to restore the erosion. So this is her tooth. This is porcelain that Harold Heindel built. So all of this is porcelain. These are her teeth. This is porcelain. And I think it integrates nicely the porcelain, the feldspathic especially, with the surrounding natural tooth structure. So I do believe that this has a nice aesthetic plus occlusal and restorative integration for this patient. And as I said, she's quite thrilled with the way this looks. Um, the porcelain restorations you saw today were by Harold Heindel, my master dental ceramist from Seattle, but he's German trained. Um, and this is his contact information if you have any questions for Harold. And as I said, if you're interested in learning more about my system to alter the vertical dimension, just go to our uh, link below this video, depending on where you are watching this video, but go to the link and you can uh, join this online seminar. I'll have this available for the next little while. If you find that you're redirected to a different link, it's just because we've turned it off for now. Um, but, you know, keep on our email list and hopefully we'll add it again if you look at this video down the road when this is turned off. But for now, if you're watching this video new, it will be available for the next little bit. So just click the register now button. It'll give you some times that it's available and you could join to watch and join this online seminar. I think you'll really like it. It's, uh, it's as I said, very detailed training, three different options when altering the vertical dimension. It's a very predictable system. I've used it for over 20 years in my practice. We have 20 year post-op photos of different cases that we've altered the vertical dimension using this system. Again, predictable system for you to use in your practice. It's simple. Um, I don't think it's complicated to implement and you should be able to use it in your practice right away. Um, as I've said, <laughs> you know, uh, I believe that uh, you can do this kind of dentistry. I do believe that beautiful dentistry with precise fit and occlusion is not just for the gurus. You know, this system helps make this kind of dentistry available for all of us kind of regular dentists like me and all of you, I, I would assume, that are watching this. I don't think very many gurus watch my videos. Uh, I'd be surprised if they do, but if they do, that's cool. Um, hi, gurus. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little weird tonight. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for joining me for this dental excellence video. And um, here's the URL. 
to join the <laughs> Vertical Dimension online seminar. And I hope everybody has a good day. So thank you very much. Take care.